Um, so I just want to talk quickly about uh, something we've been working on for the last uh, months, I guess. Uh, this is called Magic Canvas, and as is, a, is implied by the angle brackets, Magic Canvas is a React component. It's a React component for WebGL-based applications, um, and it lets you move your WebGL rendering from the client into a server-side process with the results streamed into the client. So this is a quick demo. Uh, so this is a simple 3.js um, uh, simple 3.js demo. Uh, this is a box geometry, um, and as you can see, the, the, as the mouse is moving around, it's moving a a light around the um, around the scene. And I guess the things here to to notice are yeah, that light that's being moved around the scene is controlled by the mouse, um, and the cue position um, is being persisted as we toggle this remote rendering. Uh, checkbox in the corner. So what that's doing is when it's rendering remote, as it is right now, it's um, this is being this is being rendered in a Node.js uh, backend, and the results are being streamed over WebRTC um, into the client. So let's just talk quickly about like what the code looks like to build this kind of thing. Um, so this is this is a renderer. Um, a renderer is just a module that needs to export. Uh, a default export that is a renderer function, a create renderer function, um, and that function when called uh, needs to return a render function. Uh, and the render function is just called on every um, on every draw. So uh, in this case, there's some you know 3JS setup that's happening initially um, using a WebGL rendering context. Um, you know, it's creating a camera, creating a scene, creating a mesh, adding a, the light and the mesh to the scene. Um, and then in the render function, it's just updating the cube rotation x and y, and uh, rendering the scene. Then over in your application side, you import Magic Canvas. Uh, you you create that element. You pass in a height and width prop. You set remote to true. Um, and then the the renderer that we created in the other file, we import that here. Uh, and what we do is we use a WebGL loader that takes that render file. It built it into its own uh, static bundle, um, and then it replaces the export value with the URL that then we can pass to this renderer URL. Um, so remember from the demo, we had uh, a light that was controlled by by the mouse position. So what do we do if we want to render? If we want to run the renderer based on some props that we pass in. How does that work uh, when that renderer is running in a in a backend process? So. Um, here, the, the change to the code is pretty simple. Um, we can just add a light position. We pass that in as render props. And then in the uh, render function, we uh, will have that render props available to us as the first argument. And then we just assign the x and y to the light position. Let's skip that. So we think, we think there are a couple of use cases for this. One is just you know, rendering complex scenes or doing expensive rendering techniques like physics-based rendering, such that you would need you know, specialized hardware or you need more you know, just GPU available to you. You couldn't necessarily perform it on, on a client. Um, but we also think that there's maybe an opportunity here for visualizing large data sets where you might have not only GPU constraints, but maybe really large data sets that you don't want to send over the wire into the client. So we've just got one more demo here of that. So this is a LiDAR point cloud data set from New York. This is looking down on Midtown Manhattan. Um, and the, this video is not great quality actually, but uh, so this is about 10 million points and that's about 75 megabytes. Um, so this is written in raw WebGL. And here the, the, as you can see, when we're toggling between the remote rendering and the local rendering, the camera position remains the same and that's because the camera view matrix is calculated in the front end, uh, and then that's being passed um, as render props to the um, to the back end renderer. And when, when it's rendering locally, it runs in an off thread worker. Uh, and then this is the same underlying data set, but it's slightly larger. 
So here, the, the local rendering um, includes about 12 million points. This is about 100 uh, megabytes of data. Um, and then when we toggle to remote rendering uh, here in a second, um, we're rendering four times as many points, so about 400 megabytes of data uh, and about 50 million points. Um, so to talk a little bit about how we pulled this off and about some of the challenges we face, um, I'll be going to talk us through those. Obvious are pounding in here. Hello. Are you pulling Alright. Hello, I'm Mohit. Right. So this is the technical overview of how this works. So you have your you know React stuff on the client. And that sends it straight over to a JS runtime. Right now we use Node, we're fine to maybe switch to Dino later, we'll see. And that uses headless GL, which um, basically takes the WebGL calls, convert them, converts them into Opal GL, the OpenGL ES1, and that talks to the GPU. And then we get a frame buffer out of that, pass it off to a streamer, which uses GStreamer, and that sends video over WebRTC to the client, which is, it's simple. So you know, it, 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 it's, it's quite hard to get it working, but it's in principle quite simple. So what were the challenges we had? The first challenge was that there's no WebRTC library for Node.js, or for Dino, or for Bun, or for any server-side JavaScript runtime. Um, and the second challenge, um, so that one we solved by um, getting uh, GStreamer. So what we did is we wrote a small Rust program with GStreamer bindings, and that talks to um, the Node program just over a name pipe, I think, and then, um, then we just send the data um, over WebRTC to the browser from the Rust program. Um, the biggest problem we had actually was slow encode and decode times. So for that demo that you saw, right, you might have noticed that the um, point cloud is a little bit choppy. That surprisingly is not due to network, it's due to encode and decode, so because like, we want 60 FPS, right, so that gives us 16 milliseconds for encode, decode per frame. And we were going over that deadline. And um, yeah, that was after like, getting it, like, like messing around with the codec quite a bit to get it to uh, work that well. Um, hopefully, we can find some more improvements. And um, the last one was that we had slightly inconsistent WebRTC behavior between browser implementations. If anyone here wants to talk shop about that, I would be happy to. It was a giant pain. Um, for the plans. Um, first is just to improve our WebRTC code. Um, we tried to keep it simple just for the, like, you know, for understandability reasons, but um, we want to make it a little bit more robust. And we want to use the streamer as a primitive in more complicated use cases. This is what excites me. So what we want to do is we want to have um, ways where you can send a video over and use it as a part, as a composition in your scene. Sort of like what Womp does. Um, where did yeah, sort of like what Womp does, right? Like we want, we want that to be, we want to make that really easy. And um, so if you can have like a video and depth map and you have whatever you have rendered locally, um, you have like a composite scene. Um, and I'd be very excited to see what people do with that. Um, we want to use WGPU with our Rust bindings to you have WebGPU offloading. Um, and we also want to patch headless GL to support WebGL2, which it doesn't right now. And that's about it. And you can go here to see the docs. And if you want to see a junkie live demo as well, come see me afterwards. I have my laptop here. And uh, I don't know. All right. Um, and so. Yeah. Thank you.